You're listening to Your Best Life, powered by Mercy One. Join us as we have a fun conversation with certified experts and physicians about health topics for you and your family. It's Your Best Life, our one purpose. All right. On today's episode, we are joined by Dr. Sasha Kosaravi. Um, we're going to talk about autism awareness. How are you doing today, doctor? Good. How are you? We are here to talk about autism awareness and autism awareness month is throughout the month of April. Can you kind of give us a little bit about your background and how you got um, to where you are today? Sure, I'm, a, um, I'm the chief medical officer at Clive Behavioral Health, which is a mental health facility. I'm a child psychiatrist by training, so love working with kids, love being able to t- change the trajectory of you know, someone's hopeful life. And I also work closely with our residency program at Mercy One, the psychiatry department where I'm the uh, program director. Uh, Primarily right now I'm doing the um, inpatient world. So these are kids who are actively in danger. Um, You know, that can be suicidal, aggressive, um, psychotic, manic. Those are the types of patients we see on the inpatient world. Um, Occasionally we do see some folks on the autism spectrum as well in that setting, which we try to stabilize the acute crisis and hopefully getting back to functioning in their homes, communities, and schools. Right. Um, So just kind of start off the bat, I think everyone knows that autism is a very individualized um, diagnosis. Can you kind of explain though what the autism spectrum is? I know there's been some changes over the last 20 years about how it's all classified. So can you sure. just that? Yeah, you know, at its core, it's still fundamentally recognized in the same manner it was, you know, even back into the 1940s when it was first recognized. Mm-hmm. What I look for, what autism is, is basically a developmental disorder. You know, there's some controversy whether it's actually a psychiatric diagnosis or a neurologic disorder. Um, obviously, as a psychiatrist, I treat them neurologically. There's overlap as well, so it's kind of a neuropsychiatric diagnosis in my, you know, experience. Um, and it really encompasses three main areas: um, kids who are on the autistic spectrum, or in general, and anyone who has autism will struggle with several domains in their life. And one being social skills, socialization. Uh, having trouble with um, expressing their emotion, reading emotions. Uh, A lot of kids on the spectrum will struggle to have, you know, appropriate peer-aged friends. So let's say you're a second grader, you're going to either have friends who are in sixth or seventh grade, or you're going to have kids um, who are two and three years old as your friend cohort. So it's just kind of a different sort of age range as far as your um, social, um, you know, interactions go. Um, It also encompasses language communication skills. Some kids with autism have language delays. Um, They have difficulty with conversation. A lot of kids I work with honestly have trouble with beginnings, um, middle and endings of conversations. Sometimes when I'm interviewing a child on the spectrum, there's clear points where it looks like the interview is over. Like you kind of give them some key words and guess what? The child on the spectrum a lot of time just will sit there. And so you will have to actually directly tell them very directly say, hey, the interview is over, Billy. Now you may go back to your previous activity or whatever you were doing. So um, that is also a a challenge with their language. And, you know, and behaviorally, there's also uh, a range of things we look at, you know, self-stimulating behaviors, you know, rocking, spinning you know, different textures, um, looking at fans, and then restricted patterns of interest. So some kids on the spectrum are very, sort of have a very narrow range of what they're interested in, whether it's Yu-Gi-Oh cards or Star Wars, or I mean, vacuums even, it's just very intense. Um, I had a kid who was immensely uh, into globes, just uh, globes, and parents came and saw me and say, hey, Dr. K, we have a big favor to ask you. I'm like, so what's that? They're like, well, we are um, going to Disneyland. I'm like, that's awesome. Good for you guys, you know? But then they're like, we need a favor from you. And I'm like, okay. It's like, we actually need a doctor's written permission for um, our little boy to carry his globe around Disney World. 
So actually, because that was sort of something that he was always with and always collected, uh, so he took his favorite globe to um, Disney, Disney World. So the next time this family came and visited me, they brought the family picture of their trip. And of course, it was the family and a stroller with a globe in it. So um, you'll just find these really unique range of interest, um, you know, like I mentioned. So really socially, language-wise, and then this restricted pattern of interest and self-stimulating behavior, all identified as you know a developmental disorder. Uh, I feel like you kind of covered some of them, but I am curious to know, um, are there different signs and symptoms to notice when, if a, when a child is younger versus yeah. maybe once they're like in grade school? So as far as the diagnosis of autism, I've diagnosed as young as 18 months old, set of twins I diagnosed with autistic spectrum disorder. You can start seeing some cues as early on as six months, and it can range from essentially not wanting to be cuddled, um, not really babbling, not really seeing, you know, words developing at a year old, not pointing at objects is another one, lack of eye contact. So you kind of start seeing some of this stuff fairly early um, and you may not really know what to make of it, especially if it's your first child. But then um, as they get older, yeah, things can change and some of it can depend on if they're male versus female and as such. But symbolic play is a big one. So, you know, most kids who are age two, three, four years old start developing symbolic play. So that's really what I would classify as imaginative play. So they can pretend play, you know, with their dollhouse, you know, using a banana as a phone, which is kind of imaginary. But if you get a kid who's on the spectrum, they're very mechanical in nature. So their play is essentially lining things up, stacking things. And a lot of it, you can kind of see at that age is if they're not developing that symbolic play, a lot of times that's also a sign that perhaps that uh, there's probable developmental disorder. And I, I mentioned not pointing at objects as well. So, you know, a lot of kids, if they see, you know, if you're at the zoo, you know, you see something cool, you might point and, you know, kind of express what you're interested in. Or if a plane flies by, a lot of kids will point up. A lot of kids um, will not um, on the spectrum be able to do that as well. So um, um, we see some of that early on, but those are kind of the, you know, some of the stages in their younger age. Um, but you can definitely pick this up. There's been a lot of validity to the diagnosis of autism by age two. Like we can reliably really know if a kid is on the spectrum by age two um, definitively a lot of times. And that's really, really important because the younger you diagnose, the better the prognosis. And these kids that we diagnosed at 18 months old, they had an older brother who was on the spectrum who was diagnosed when he was five or six. And the difference, the trajectory of these 18 month old kids versus their brother was significantly different because we had early interventions. These kids did you know, extremely well moving forward with their um, ability to function. Whereas their older brother who was diagnosed much later kind of struggled with a lot of different areas. So, you know, you see it consistently, earlier intervention with autistic spectrum disorder always points to a better prognosis. Is that because you're able to kind of teach them and to teach the people around them as well, uh, kind of how to interact and all that stuff? Is that why the early? Yeah, diagnosis? so that kind of gets into the treatment modality a little bit of how we treat autism. Mm -hmm. There's no cure really to autism. It's a lifelong disorder. So once you have it, it doesn't go away. So what we're aiming to do is help with your functioning. So there's different kinds of therapy. There's different types of interventions, which we can get into a little bit. Um, the younger you diagnose, again, the better the prognosis. So we uh, focus on speech therapy um, with their language development. We focus on occupational therapy because there's a lot of sensory integrative type disorders. You know, they're sensitive to tags or socks, you know, or tightness or pressure. There's different sorts of sensory 
issue. Sometimes it's overly stimulated. Sometimes it's under stimulated. Some kids on the spectrum don't feel pain when they're banging their head against the wall. They just don't feel it. Right. So occupational therapy or sensory integration is also really important. Some of them will have gross or fine motor skill deficits. So physical therapy is also extremely important. So the earlier you can interview in with their language development, with their sensory integration issues, with their fine and gross motor skills, obviously it's going to point to a better prognosis. There's also a very um, important type of therapy called applied behavioral analysis or ABA therapy, universally accepted as maybe the treatment of choice for um, autistic spectrum disorders. These are when life lessons or even really basic things are broken down into simplest parts and the desired answers or behaviors are rewarded. And if it's not desired, it's completely ignored. Um, and there's also a variation of that. It's called, I think, pivotal response training, where you actually are not in the clinic setting, but you're actually in the real world. And you're essentially like helping them initiate communication skills or communicating with others and practicing that. So social skills training is obviously a big thing that early. So I would say those are kind of the really big things. I mean, um, there's a lot of other interventions. Um, yeah. Obviously, being a psychiatrist, as they get older, there's medication interventions, potentially. Again, these are just medications that treat the behaviors of autism, but not necessarily the core of autism. Mm -hmm. um, there's different kinds of diet because there's, you know, the leaky gut um, syndrome um, philosophy where they feel like, kids on the spectrum um, don't digest things or their bacteria um, in their gut really prevents them. They're either over abundance of certain bacteria or under abundance with this, with, there's a genetic predisposition with that. It's called microbiomes basically, where you have um, difficulty with, you know, potentially digesting and then toxins building up. So, you know, the world of probiotics and treating that is really important as well. And then, um, you know, uh, like I said, the medication piece is there too. You know, we use a lot of um, medications like, you know, these are off label, some of them. So I just want to make sure that's known. Um, but, you know, medications like Lexapro or Prozac or Zoloft sometimes will help with that rigidity, that difficulty with transitions. You know, kids on the spectrum get really obsessed. They get really uh, perseverative in their thought process. So a lot of these medications will allow them to be less rigid, be able to transition. And of course, some kids on this spectrum are extremely aggressive and can hurt themselves or others. Um, that's sometimes a myth. You know, sometimes when we think of autistic kids, we think that, but it's not as common, but it definitely does exist. And occasionally we'll use, you know, antipsychotics or mood stabilizers if it's to a point where we're really endangering their life um, or someone else's life with their aggression. So you know, Abilify and Risperdal also have FDA actually indications for disruptive behaviors associated with autism. So there's a variety of tools we have um, with treatments. And um, those are some of the basic ones that we can utilize right off the bat. Yeah, I uh, wanted to kind of back up at the beginning, you had said that there are sometimes different symptoms between boys and girls. Uh, I, when I was looking just about information about autism and stuff, I know that uh, boys are diagnosed at a higher rate. Is there any reason as to why there's different symptoms or can you explain like yeah. what, uh, which one you see more in boys versus girls kind of thing? In psychiatry, unfortunately, a lot of things are unknown still, um, but I think that's getting better. So I don't think there's a clear cut answer to that question of why, but there's definitely theories, there's definitely ideas, which I can definitely capture for you. Um, one area is that boys with autism tend to have what we call more externalizing behaviors or presentations. So what I mean by externalizing is they're more hyper, um, they're more aggressive, they have sometimes have more repetitive behaviors, and the restricted patterns of interest sometimes are more pronounced in boys. So if you think about that, if a two, three-year-old is really presenting with intense aggression, hyperactivity that can't be controlled, guess what? They're probably gonna present to their doctor or pediatrician and say, hey, can you kind of guide us? Is this normal? Is this not normal? It's kind of, and then that might actually build into an autism workup. 
So that's one reason you might see the ratios. I think it can be anywhere from two to five times more for boys. Traditionally, it's a four to one ratio, boys versus girls, I think. Um, so if they're presenting a lot earlier and they have a lot of externalizing behaviors, guess what? We're gonna probably see more boys diagnosed. Whereas girls have more of what we call internalizing behaviors. So that's more of a, we see a little bit more depression and anxiety and kind of an internal process with autism and not as much of an externalizing type pattern. There's also theories on brain structures, specifically your cortex, which is the outer layer of your brain. Um, it seems to have a protective mechanism in a recent study. The thinner the cortex is in your brain, the more prone you are to autism. And guess what? Males generally tend to have thinner cortexes. So that's one theory. Um, the other one is just chromosomally, um, um, genetically, um, the male chromosomes seem to have a higher predisposition. And there's even some thoughts of, you know, your hormones, sex hormones, testosterone may actually um, predispose you to an uh, autism phenotype. So I think part of it's just they present more. I think there's probably some brain structural um, differences. And I think there's um, some theories of um, hormones and mm -hmm. just the uh, genetic presentation of the chromosomes that make males a little bit more prone. So does that make it more difficult? So I, I guess what I find interesting is because girls maybe don't present the same way, does that mean that they kind of go, their diagnoses kind of go unnoticed for longer? Yeah, definitely. I, I think we start seeing maybe a little bit more of Clinically, I seen that I, I start seeing them a little bit more towards late elementary school um, or middle school, where you start running into more social pressures, um, peer pressures. Um, so it becomes a little bit more obvious if they're having some social deficits or difficulty academically, potentially um, yeah. as well. So yeah, I think it can definitely go kind of prodormal or hidden for a longer period of time before we see them. And it's a, a little bit different presentation. I mean, they still have some of those core deficits, but it just may not be as um, the intensity and the uh, you know aggressive levels are certainly not as much traditionally. It's not always the case. I've had you know girls with autism who are look you know like a boy's presentation at times, so it's not clear cut. But right. if you look at it you know uh, universally or you know over you know multiple um, patients, it's definitely more common in boys. All right. When I was doing some research, I um, a lot of people were asking what the difference between autism and Asperger's is. And Asperger's is a branch with under the autism spectrum disorder, right? These terms are, you know, kind of inter interchanged sometimes. Yeah. Autism, autism spectrum disorders, previously also known as pervasive developmental disorders was a very common term. Um, Asperger's, as you mentioned, and high functioning autism. Those terms really don't exist anymore in the new uh, classification. Um, Asperger's was eliminated, pervasive developmental disorders was eliminated as a term, but it was so commonly used, it's still carrying forward. People still use it very commonly. Um, and the main difference between the um, Asperger's and classic autism is um, that you don't have any cognitive um, deficits with Asperger's, and that's why it's synonymous with high functioning. So generally, there's no IQ deficits, there's no intellectual disability, and you usually develop language on time, so there's no clear-cut language delay. With that being said, there's still language deficits, and I think conversation's still challenging. Uh, sometimes there's a lack of inflection with a lot of kids on the spectrum that's still on Asperger's, um, but Asperger's essentially is higher-functioning autism, where there's no cognitive deficits and there's no language delays, but they still really struggle with some of the behavioral things we have already mentioned and some of the social deficits as well. And so, classic autism is really when you have all of the, you know, symptoms at a more severe level. And that's what sometimes people think of as classic autism, where they think of the child who's intellectually challenged, is nonverbal, is banging their head aggressively. And sometimes they look at that as what they define as autism. Um, but it, again, as you mentioned early on, it's so individualized, it's such a broad spectrum. And that's why I really love autism and the diagnosis is because it can present so differently and the kids are so unique and they have so many different 
you know, ways they're trying to find their way in um, talents and, you know, things that are just, um, you know, you really grow to love about them and treat them. Um, and it's, uh, it's, 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 again, a unique individualized diagnosis a lot of times, even though we have this syndrome, obviously, or this um, spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love that you said that. Um, I agree. Um, so actually, that kind of leads into my next question. What I was going to ask was, what are some common misconceptions and stereotypes that you interact, that you have to deal with um, when, when talking yeah. about them? Well, I think uh, one thing is, I feel like, you know, kids on the spectrum can't be successful. Um, I think there's a wide range of, you know, again, as we've already alluded to, there's a wide range of challenges with autism, but there's also a lot of unique um, things that can potentially um, have these children function, adults function well, even with their autistic spectrum disorder. So I think uh, they can be successful with the right treatment, with the right settings, with the right support system. Um, so, I, and I think they can have relationships. I think sometimes um, we think they can't have relationships and the relationship may look different and it may have some challenges. And sometimes it's kind of robotic in nature. Um, if you watch kids play with other kids, sometimes on the spectrum, uh, they are, um, you know, sometimes they treat the other kids as objects and they're really more focused on rules and regulations of play versus the actual act of play. So they still enjoy being around those people and other kids, it's just different. They're just really focused on other aspects of play. Um, so it's just kind of hard to kind of put yourself in those shoes and kind of come from that perspective. It's also a kind of a, sometimes we feel like maybe they can't have feelings, they can't have emotions and they, they have trouble expressing their emotions, but they can definitely um, have emotions, they can have feelings. And sometimes I hear, you know, you know autism has a certain look um, there's really no certain look. There's no, um, you know, sometimes there's some genetic overlap, fragile X being one um, where you, some of those kids can have, um, um, you know, autism potentially, but there's no certain look for a kid with autism. There's, um, sometimes they think there's some facial dysmorphology or some things different about them. And that's typically not the case. Uh, the other thing is sometimes parents get blamed, and this is very common maybe 30 years ago, 40 years ago, where moms were classified as refrigerator moms of kids who had autism, meaning they were cold, maybe, meaning they weren't showing their kids love and emotion, and that made their kids on the spectrum. So that theory has been thrown out as well. Obviously, it's a genetic, it's a developmental thing. It's you know, obviously it can be impacted by the environment, but um, bad parenting, et cetera, refrigerator moms as they were labeled, um, definitely are not um, a causal um, reason for your child to have autism. You know, those are some of the stereotypes um, that sometimes I hear. Wow. When somebody comes in and their child is diagnosed with autism, whether it's at 18 or, or 18 months or six years or whatever, I imagine that the parents have lots of questions and probably some anxiety around everything, you know? Uh, so what do you kind of, what, what kind of advice do you give them? How do you help them transition with this new information? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And a lot of times initially, it's honestly, it's devastating. Um, it's really hard on parents. Um, in some ways, it's a relief because maybe they have some answers now and they can kind of pick up the pieces. But it's also very hard sometimes having a child on the spectrum because um, that emotional reciprocity sometimes is not there. I'll give you a really simple kind of scenario that might explain how, how parents might feel. Um, so kids on the spectrum have you know, a lot of talents, they can do things. And one kid I had had tremendous artwork, like amazing, um, had a really abil great ability for arts and would always have these amazing things in their backpacks um, and get lots of accolades and lots of praise from their teachers on what a wonderful job they're doing, what great artwork they're doing. And this child would never take any of this out of their backpack and actually say, hey, mom, hey, dad, look, 
look, this is amazing work I've done. Aren't you proud of me? They don't really sometimes look for that affirmation. Not all kids on the spectrum kind of depend on the severity, but it's really heartbreaking to me that a parent can enjoy or get that joy of feeling that. Um, and sometimes kids on the spectrum have difficulty reading your emotions. So they may treat you the same way, regardless of, you know, you have a bad day occasionally, I have a bad day occasionally. Some days you're, you know, more energetic when you come home. Some days you're really beat down. And guess what? The kid on the spectrum sometimes really struggles with seeing that or reading that. So they essentially kind of treat you the same regardless. Um, so that interaction becomes sometimes a little bit challenging for some parents and kind of understanding and not personalizing that uh, is important because um, they don't sometimes have that ability. But that can get better over time with social skills and training. So there's hope. Hope is a key word. Um, when I talk to parents about their child and the diagnosis of autism, and there's hope within, you know, the immense amount of research and money and things that are we're figuring out with genetically and treatment wise. Every day there's some new article, new study. Um, I think eventually we'll have really solidified genetic markers or testing, um, whether it's MRI imaging of the brain or whether it's lab studies or metabolism studies, there's lots going on. So I always kind of give them some sense of hope that this is in a really evolving field. And what we know now is going to be a lot different than 10 years from now. And progressively, it's going to really help your child over time. And I could go over some of the therapies we mentioned, you know, as far as improving their functioning, but remembering their child as an individual, right? They're not, they're not an autistic child is the way I say. I don't, one of my biggest pet peeves is when we label people. So bipolar person or a borderline person. I, I don't like that. I, you know, I, I tend to use, and I teach my residents this, and if they're listening, hopefully they, it's a good um, review of that. You know, it's a child struggling with autism or it's a child struggling with autism challenges and, um, or social deficits or language or behavior things we've already talked about. So I think it's important to, you know, look at them as a, still as a kid and, you know, a kid who struggles with things, but Again, focusing on their strengths, focusing on what they do well. And then hopefully the, um, obviously the, um, a lot of the treatments and um, ways we can improve their functioning are key. I think building a support system is really important for a parent, you know, being involved with uh, Autism Speaks or, you know, organizations that may have um, parental support groups, I think are important. And that could be also important with social skills getting your kids together um, sometimes, you know, sometimes there's not a huge, um, you know, a lot of kids who just want to, you know, get together, especially if they're really mechanical in their play or not really interacting. Uh, sometimes it's easier to maybe um, get, you know, children on the spectrum together as well. Um, so, you know, it's a good mix. Sometimes you obviously you want to intermix them with quote unquote, um, more, you know, conventional non-autistic children, but in general, um, um, that can be helpful as well for social skills. And the other thing you really want to do, sometimes uh, it becomes almost a crusade or a mission of just everything autism, like your whole world revolves around autism and you tend to forget about your partner and you tend to forget about your other kids who are maybe not struggling with autism. So take a step back. Obviously, you're going to be there for your kiddo, but really, you know, make sure you take time with your partner, make sure you take time with your other kids and spend time with them or make sure you focus on them as well. So, you know, that's one thing I notice is some other kids I see um, that are struggling and in families who have a, you know, special needs child, sometimes they are forgotten or not invested as much because, you know, the other child takes so much time. It's really important to step back and take care of them as well. And obviously your um, significant other or your partner in life, um, I think it's really important to uh, be able to not just be a parent all the time, but a person. Um, I liked what you said about, um, I think that I believe the term is people first language, uh, saying, making sure to not label people when you're talking about them. Um, so I thank you for pointing that out. I think that's very important to also know. Autism Awareness Month is um, great for the month of April, but really, with the rates of autism being about one in 54 right now. I mean, likelihood of your family or someone that you love closely or a friend 
being impacted by autism is going to be pretty prevalent. So I think it's really important to educate yourself and really know um, the challenges of these children and how we can help them be successful. Because ultimately, that's my job as a psychiatrist um, when I see them or, you know, when I'm guiding the family is I'm going to do everything I can to help them function in their community schools and um, socially as well. But yeah, it's, it's such a uh, the prevalence rates are so high that you know, I think this Awareness Month is great again, but uh, hopefully um, uh, we get to a point where, um, you know, these kids can function really well and we can, you know, treat them like any other kid. Yes. Because well, at their core, they're still children and they have a lot of the same um, characteristics of other kids. In fact, sometimes they um, have more, um, um, some of their talents are hidden, you just kind of out of bring them out. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Kosaravi. I really appreciate getting to talk to you about this. Yeah, my pleasure. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening. Send us feedback by emailing podcast at mercyhealth.com and visit us online at mercyone.org backslash podcast for all of our episodes.